Okay, so we're starting Chapter 6 today. I can sense your deep excitement about it. I don't know if the projector... Yeah, it did. Okay, good. So, so this is criminal law. It's the part that everybody's excited about because they've watched Law and Order, like, and they know how criminal law works. You're pretty much lawyers because you've watched Law and Order. I get it. Um, pretty much. Uh, anyway, so there's your learning objectives for the chapter straight out of the textbook. Um, and again, I don't have to read them to you because you're smart people. So I'm just going to move forward. So, so I, I think the first thing that's not really up here but that we have to do is, is identify um, the difference between uh, a crime as opposed to a civil, um, a civil offense. Uh, and we already did this earlier in the, in the course, but we said that in essence a civil offense is a harm against an individual typically, whereas a crime is a harm against society as a whole. That certain behaviors, even if they're perpetrated only against another individual, are so heinous in their nature that we feel they harm the entire fabric of society. And that's what a crime is. Um, crimes are defined by statute. And what that means is that there are laws passed by the state legislatures and by the federal legislature uh, that define what a crime is and what it isn't. And typically, they're, they're relatively narrow. Okay, In other words, there has to be specific situational issues uh, defined in the law to, to decide when something is a crime. It's an a good example would be uh, killing another person, right? homicide, the, the killing of another human being. Um, there's a relatively narrow definition of when that is a crime and when it's not. Right? There may be times when you kill another person, but it's not a crime. If you're a soldier in a war scenario and you kill somebody in a, in a fight on the battlefield, almost nobody would consider that a crime. Now, many individuals have to sort of struggle with, is that a crime before God? Right? They have, people deal with that and struggle with those problems. Uh, that's a, another byproduct of war is a whole bunch of people with consciences that won't let them live uh, happy lives after that. Uh, or like a self-defense situation. That's a homicide if you kill somebody in self-defense, but most states by statute have defined when that sort of self-defense is not criminal uh, as opposed to when it, you know, it, it doesn't meet their standards. And then a crime must have these two elements. Uh, those, these are the Latin terms for it that they use in, in law. One is called mens rea, uh, which means criminal intent. So you have to be intending to commit a crime. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about it later. It, you don't always have to be intending to commit a crime. It, um, if, if you're doing something that is, say, particularly dangerous, um, and your intent was to do the dangerous thing, and then a crime occurs because of that, you, that's still intent, okay? We'll, we'll talk about that more. And then the other is what's called actus reus, or criminal action. It's not enough to just think about doing, you know, to think, man, Maybe I'll rob a bank someday. If you, if you never actually act on that thought, you haven't committed a crime. Probably all of us have thought of doing things, usually that involve strangling someone who's driving us crazy, but have never acted on those thoughts. Maybe maybe you've never thought that, but uh, maybe not too in depth anyway. Uh, you know, but probably even if it's not strangling somebody, there's been times when you felt like you wanted to, you know, even pushing someone is actually a crime. Right? We just don't, we hardly ever, we kind of look at the situation and decide, is, it, is this something worth trying? Right? Yeah. You're still, I don't have a voice. Okay. But, so like you say, you don't act on it. Mm hmm. So how do On conspiracy and things like that. We'll talk about conspiracy in a minute. Uh huh. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about it in a minute. All right. Um, all right, so these are some of the broad types of crime. The first are called offenses against the person. There's probably a Latin term for that too, but I don't speak Latin. Um, homicide, which we all know. Uh, many states, including Arizona, they, they split up homicide. 
Um, they'll call this first degree murder a lot of places. That's a homicide that had what's called malice aforethought. Malice, anybody know what the term malice means? Yeah, yeah, the Latin prefix mal means bad, right? Like anybody, like, um, like muy mal in Spanish, right? So, so malice just means like harmful or, or, or bad intent, okay? So if you have malice aforethought, um, that means you, you planned to harm them, okay? It doesn't necessarily mean you plan to kill them. Sometimes you could have malice in other ways, like you were, in plan you were planning to rob them, and then they resisted and you killed them. Well, that's still, you had, you had ill intent, and that led to the death of another person, okay? And the courts have been pretty broad with that term. In my mind, malice of forethought means like I planned this thing out. Um, but the courts have said, you know, if you, uh, if you go into someone's, you know, home and you're taking a gun with you, then you plan this thing out ahead. Even if your intent wasn't to kill them when you entered, you created a situation with your, you know, but this oftentimes does not apply in to what are called like heat of, heat of, of passion crimes. You know, someone walks into their home and finds their spouse cheating on them and kills their spouse. They don't usually charge them with first degree. They usually, uh, no, it's not legal. Uh, I mean, it's still murder, but it's, it's usually, in essence, what they say is there's a mitigating factor here. This is, this is like a scenario which a lot of rational people that would never murder somebody might be pushed to a level of, of violence that they wouldn't normally be, right? And so they usually will call it like a, a, a second-degree murder or something like that. Usually second-degree murder involves this intent to inflict great bodily harm. Um, you know, we're involved in a bar fight, and I'm going to beat you to a pulp, but I don't intend to kill you, but I accidentally kill you. Well, that's not as bad as malice aforethought, like planning out your murder. Um, but there was still some malice intended. You were into the fight. You could have backed off the fight. Uh, and you were intending to hurt the person, and your hurting went so far that you killed them. And that is worse than something like manslaughter. With manslaughter, there's no malice. It's usually uh, killing somebody by, uh, oh, what's the word? Uh, by accident. By, but not just by accident, but by, um, you know, accident that's your fault. That's manslaughter. Okay, I'm trying to remember the term. That's like an obvious term that I can't remember. But yeah, Bryson. Yeah, and some states, Arizona, I think, does they have something they call vehicular manslaughter. Uh, and usually just, you know, like manslaughter often carries something like a five-year sentence as opposed to second degree, which might be 7 to 20, depending on aggravating and mitigating factors, as opposed to first degree, which is like life or even the death penalty. Yeah. Probably not. Um, and, and, and so th this is where the idea, so if you fall asleep while you're driving and you kill somebody, but you weren't drinking, you weren't doing anything wrong, they might charge you, but it's also a good chance they might say this was an accident, a pure accident, as opposed to falling asleep while you're drunk, saying you took an action ahead of time that you knew could lead to, to this. So... But it, it depends. Sometimes they do charge, you know, that negligence is the word I'm thinking of, by the way, that I couldn't think of a minute ago. Um, but is falling asleep negligence? Probably. Should you stop and get some rest if you're, you know, but I think there's sort of a, a broad recognition that between I was drowsy and didn't realize how drowsy I was and I fell asleep as opposed to I was drinking and then I passed out at the wheel. So, so even with when it comes to murder, society has recognized over time and through statute that there's a fair amount of of gradation you know the cold heartless killer that that, that plans out and and goes and kidnaps and murders people is very different than the than even the drunk driver as far as their intent and their you know they're not out to hurt people but instead they're maybe selfish and and thoughtless and they kill somebody and and the law typically gets those things right, but they screwed up sometimes, right? That's, that's law. All right, so the second type of assault against the person is assault and battery. Um, sorry, my typing wasn't good there. Um, so battery is the unlawful application of force. 
I don't have to punch you or beat you to a pulp to be guilty of battery. I could, I could, I could shove you, push you, and if I do that in an unlawful way, I could be charged with battery. Um, again, so when we say unlawful, we're talking about self-defense. Or a lot of times, most st states have like a reasonable and prudent sort of, of clause in their in their uh, um, statute that says, you know, if a normal person would have you know pushed something away, but like theoretically, if I was uh, if I uh, had asked everybody to clean up their desks, and then I came along and I found dirt on your desk and I rubbed it on your your sleeve to show my disdain for how poor of a job you've done, I've committed a battery, right? That force wasn't warranted, and even though I probably didn't hurt you, that's not the point. The point is I shouldn't be touching people unlawfully, okay? And an assault is actually an attempt to commit a battery. And so, and in many statutes, it's also, it could be almost any behavior that, uh, that could cause a reasonable or prudent person to fear being battered, okay? Um, so threatening and intimidating sort of behavior, can you can be charged uh, with an assault. Um, but we have to keep the balance, right? Because what we don't want is, you know, anytime you hurt someone's feelings, now you're going to court because, you know, two people were sharing their opinions in class and one person took offense at what the other person said. That's not assault, okay? So at each state's laws can be slightly different. Offenses against property, so theft is probably the most common one. There's a whole bunch of terms that kind of get used all together that sometimes mean something slightly different and might even have slightly different definitions depending on which state's statute you're looking at. Okay, Theft is just stealing personal property from another person. Robbery is larceny by force, violence, or intimidation. So typically robbery is thought of as worse than just, right, Shoplifting usually, if you shoplift, you get like a you'll get like a ticket. You'll have to pay a fine. You don't usually go to prison for shoplifting. Um, grand theft is stealing of things that are of a much higher value, right? You've heard of Grand Theft Auto, the video game, right? Um, in that game, you're stealing cars, and and cars have a high value. Uh, and then robbery is stealing by force. And then embezzlement is a special kind of stealing. And it's stealing property that the thief was already in legal possession of. So let's say your job requires you to handle your owners of the business's money. It was legal for you to be in possession of that money because it was part of your course of your duties, right? So when you so the law got all confused in the early days of of, of common law as to like well possession of the money did that make it theirs in that moment and you know there was all these sort of things you have to sort of define out by through but in essence it's it's come to where now we tend to think of embezzlement usually as worse than just plain theft because it almost always involves betraying a trust right if your employer says i entrust you with this cash and then you steal from them you've not only stolen um, you know, or like when you shoplift, you go steal from somebody, but you know, you never really made any commitment to that person. I'm not saying it's right to steal, but it's different than them, than you kind of winning someone's trust and then stealing from them. That's embezzlement. So those are three kind of types of theft. Other offenses against property include receiving stolen property, which is a little scary, right? Because if you buy in, in this modern world of Craigslist and and uh, eBay and and other things. Don't you think eBay is a good place to fence stuff that you steal? Because there's kind of like no personal connection between you and the buyers. But you have to know that cops really keep a close watch, especially if high dollar items are stolen. They watch for someone to list those in those areas and sell them. But that means that receiving stolen property is a crime that somebody lists something on, on Craigslist at a good price. You go, you look at it, you like it, you buy it from them you may have committed a crime, except that we're back to the concept of mens rea. Did you have any criminal intent at all? Probably not. Was there any way you could have known it was stolen? Probably not. But do you think there's people that have inklings at times that this is probably stolen because the price is so good or the deal is just too right and ignore that feeling and go ahead and buy it anyway? 
now you're moving into more dangerous territory, right? And then if they can show that, let's say, you did know that so your neighbor had something stolen a week ago and then some guy sold it to you and you really had reason to believe. And of course, the easiest is when when somebody knows it's stolen. You know, there's a, there's people who have, they call fences. That's That's the street name, I guess, for them. And what a fence does is they specialize in selling stolen property. Because a lot of the times the people who steal property are trying to do it for quick money. And then the fence will make, they're sort of like the wholesalers of the criminal world. They'll, you know, they'll give you your quick money for your drugs or whatever you're trying to get for the stuff you've stolen. And then they'll find buyers who are willing to pay better prices and they'll make money on the difference. That's what a fence does. Um, uh, Mike Peterson, he's our, uh, our uh, Graham County um, court, superior court judge here. He told me that about 95% of all crime in Gila Valley, so in Graham County, is drug-related. Either directly drug-related, like people buying and selling drugs uh, or, you know, whatever, or indirectly related, like people burglarizing people's homes or committing theft so that they can buy drugs. Um, you know, he says, if, if we could have all drugs gone, that our crime rate would drop to, to nearly nothing here. Most violent crimes involve drugs uh, in our in our county. I mean, that's not really surprising when you think about it, right? I own storage, a storage business, and we've had people break into our storages and, and steal stuff, and almost every time it's been like someone who's a friend of or family to the people storing, so they know what they're storing in there. Um, and it's almost always drug money related. Like, you know, I know that my sister has you know, four rims in there that we could sell for a hundred bucks and then we could buy some drugs with it. Um, only once have I had someone who was just, you know, just stealing, just, I think it's because breaking into a storage shed is like a, a low, low chance of high success sort of crime. A lot of people just store kind of crap in there, you know, their Christmas tree and, and clothes that are too small for the kids. And so breaking in there doesn't often yield you a lot of high dollar items and you'd have to break into a bunch of them. It'd be a ton of work. Uh, whereas going into someone's home, people almost always have valuable things in their homes. But then you risk getting shot, too. So there's the trade-off, especially in this county, right? There's enough people with guns in this county that I think breaking into people's homes may not be a smart idea around here. All right. So that was receiving stolen property. It's a crime to knowingly receive stolen property. Forgery. Anybody know what forgery is? What is forgery? Yeah, faking documents, faking signatures. Yeah. They wouldn't be able to charge you. Why do you ask? <laughs> Sorry. All right. So forgery is the faking of documents, faking signatures on documents. Uh, the most common faked or forged document, anybody have a guess? Well, that probably actually is. I was talking about from criminal prosecutions, it's checks, right? Because a check is pretty much cash when it's signed by the the authorized user. So. So people, and honestly, the bank can't check, you know, the, the volume of checks is so high that, that people, you know, can just pretty much sign any signature on there. So this is something I used to use. I don't think it would hold up in court. When I was a kid and I would, you know, write a fake note from my mom, I have a really sloppy signature, so I would just sign it with my signature. My thinking was if I was ever questioned, which, by the way, I never was, but if I was ever questioned, I would just say I wasn't faking my mom's. I was writing my own note and signing it. And, you know, to me that was worse, less worse than forgery. That was my logic. Because uh, then the worst they could say is, no, you're not allowed to write your own notes. Like, oh, my bad. Like that. Um, they said they never got questioned on it. We, we learned this, again, when you have nine children, you learn certain things. Like the attendance office at the school. Like, I don't think the ladies even read the notes because we started writing increasingly ridiculous notes for our kids to see if we could get a response because we knew a couple of ladies in the office and we thought that they'd think it was funny and be like, oh, that's hilarious. You know, so we would write it like either like in Middle English, 
uh, type of language or something or or you know we would like make up some crazy thing they're doing like please excuse Tommy from school today he's busy castrating bulls or like stuff and, like just to see if like there'd be any response at all and like never was there any response uh, maybe growing up around here people are like oh castration day yeah of course the kids wouldn't be at school that day uh, I don't know by the way once a bull's castrated it's not a bull it's a steer so I guess you castrate bulls you know you you enter the castration station as a bull, but you leave as a steer. Um, uh, uh, well, I'm not a okay. Anyway, extortion. Anybody know what extortion is? Extortion. You do? Yeah. Google no? Yeah. But now, how are things now that we're not just under the common law? Um, a common example of selling a building that can be refused to issue a permit on the basically. Okay. So, yeah, well, so it's, it's sort of like forced bribery. It's kind of like, bribery is like if I offer you an inducement to maybe allow me to get through the inspection or something without. Extortion would be if you say, like, hey, I could make this happen for you if... Uh, Yes, it is blackmail. And so, in fact, blackmail has come to mean extortion by a non-government official. Like, let's say you find out somebody has um, been cheating on their taxes, and you say, hey, I could keep this quiet if, you know, say half the amount you save by cheating on your taxes comes to me. That's blackmail, and that's a form of extortion. Uh, like he said, under the common law, extortion was, was usually meant to me mean government officials who would use their positions to then extort people. Tax collectors a lot of times, right? You owe this much to the government, um, but we could settle up here for this amount. Hey, there's no corruption in El Salvador. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, could you have gone the legal route still? Yes. Probably not. That was a solicitation for a bribe. So extortion involves some degree of force, meaning either you're going to do it my way or you're not going to get what you want. This his is more like you could do it the hard way or I can make it easy for you, which is a solicitation for a bribe. They're very closely related if you think about it. Um, the one is just using your authority to, to, you know, to force the issue more. And so if you think about a lot of the hashtag Me Too stuff that we've been hearing about, where these, you know, Harvey Weinstein, who kind of says, hey, I can, you know, you want to be an actress, I can make your dreams come true. That's a form of extortion, right? Uh, or, uh, you know, or, or at least a solicitation of, of a sexual bribe, so to speak. You know, you, you, you make my life easy, I can make your life easy. That type of mindset. It's it's misuse of authority um, to extort money or some other favors from somebody. And to me, that sort of, and I think to most Americans, that sort of misuse of authority is, is particularly heinous. We really hate people who are who kind of use their authority to, to, to use people. It really gets under our skin for some reason. It seems like it's taking away their liberty in a way that's really un, uncool. Offenses against habitation. So a habitation is a home. So certain things could be committed directly against the home. This is burglary. So burglary, we tend to think of burglary as theft, but most of the time when someone commits burglary, they're actually committing two crimes, burglary and theft. Okay, To burgle is to break and enter of a, dwe a dwelling in the nighttime, is how this was defined in the common law, uh, with intent to commit a felony. 
So you, so if you break into someone's home and then they have a gun and you run away and you never committed another crime, you still committed burglary, even if you didn't steal anything. Okay. What's that? Well, so that was a question, right? Like, what if I do it during the day? And so most states by statute have, have taken out a lot of that nighttime language because, yeah, because everybody's at work, right? Um, so burglary is breaking into someone's home typically. Arson, under the common law, it was, it was a malicious burning of the dwelling of another. Statutes today have sort of broadened that to say burning any building in a felonious way. I love the word felonious. Um, that's arson. Other types of offenses include bribery, which we just talked about, the corrupt payment or receipt of a payment for official action, and perjury, giving false oaths. oaths. Um, all right, that's lots of crimes and kind of in different categories to think about. So. Um, we also have white collar crime. Anybody ever watched the show White Collar? You can you can Netflix binge it. I think it's still there. I don't know. So here's I'm not going to spend a ton of time on them, even though really I should because these are the ones that a lot of businesses actually deal with. Um, so they include mail or wire fraud. So pretty much using the mail to defraud anybody is a crime. Okay, fraud is already a crime, but using the mail to do it means you did another crime on top of it. Um, and as a federal crime, which, hey, if you're going to do a crime, federal prisons are pretty cushy. So, uh, I mean, it's still prison, and there's still that guy that wants to be your special friend in prison. So, I mean, that still happens in federal prisons, but you, just, you don't want to be in any prison. What's an example of that? So let's say I... Uh, let's say I, I'm trying to trick old people into paying me money for, uh, I mean, any number of things. You know, I, I, I can tell them that their, their Medicare isn't going to cover all their costs, but if they'll, if they'll buy into this thing, it will, it will provide them the coverage to, to protect them. If I, if, so if, if I do that by the phone um, and then I get them to send their payment to me through the mail, I've committed fraud and I've used the mail to do that. So that's mail fraud. That's all. Um, antitrust law. You guys remember Martha Stewart? She's trying to make a comeback with her Jack in the Box commercials. Uh, she used to run these like home shows and stuff like that. Well, she got busted on uh, antitrust um, securities uh, violations, uh, insider trading in essence, where she used information that was not available to the public to make investments. Uh, and she went to jail for a couple years on that. Um, Food and Drug Act. Mostly the Food and Drug Act says that it prohibits people from like adulterating food and drug things so like you can't sell something somehow it answered my phone are you there I think it's not answered. That was really odd. So apparently my earpiece is, even though it's connected to this, it was connected to my phone in my office, and it was ringing, and then it answered. And I was like, uh, hi. Anyway, uh, <laughs> if you're still there, enjoy the lecture. Um, so the Food and Drug Act says you can't adulterate food products. Like if you say something is, you know, mashed carrots in this, in this baby food, you can't, like, mix other things into it without putting them on the label. So even if you were, you know, so as long as you say it's mashed carrots and corn syrup, then you're not breaking the law. But if if you were to say, uh, this was because people would sell, like, medicines to people and then, like, water them way down to save the cost of the medicine. So they passed this Food and Drug Act. So violating that is a, is a crime. Okay, environmental crime, violations of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. This mostly has to do with bribing foreign officials. Um, there's a lot of countries in the world where bribery is the norm. Okay, that's just how they do business. Well, an American citizen can't legally do it, um, which really puts us at a disadvantage sometimes if you think about it competing against international companies who don't have similar laws in their country. Um, anyway, so those are challenges. Um, the RICO Act, uh, that's racketeering and organized crime, um, computer crime. Anyway, I'm not, like I said, I don't want to spend a ton of time on these. But these are all considered white-collar crime as opposed to, like, murdering people or assaulting them. Um, these are, you know, using the computer to, to 
get people's passwords and get into their accounts and, and steal information that you can then sell or, or things like that. Um, what's interesting is, well, we'll talk about it in a minute here. So I mentioned before, um, in order for something to be a crime, you have to have intent and you have to have an act, okay? Um, so some of the defenses, you can say, look, I didn't really attempt to do it. This gets back to your question um, about how do they get people when they say, um, so let's say somebody has posted on Facebook, I'm going to go shoot up a school, right? But then they never did. Did they commit a crime? Threats have to be very specific. That's pretty specific. But how specific does it have to be? That's iffy, right? And then, you know, when did it become an attempt? If I say I'm going to go shoot up a school and then I start to buy a bunch of guns and stockpile ammo and I draw up a map of the school and put marks where I think would be good places to position myself, have I gone far enough yet? Probably, okay? And that's what conspiracy is. Conspiracy to commit a crime is when you've taken action toward the commission of the crime, but you never fully got there, okay? An attempted crime is when I actually tried to do the crime, but something foiled me from it. Like I tried to shoot somebody and I missed. Usually an attempted crime carries a lesser penalty than a completed crime. Attempted murder, less than regular murder. What time is it? I don't have a... What time is it? Guys? Huh? Okay. Um, conspiracy is a little tough. Let's say three of us are working together and we're going to commit, you know, we're going to rob a bank or something. We're going to Ocean's Eleven it. Um, and then one of us goes out and purchases some weapons and another one of us goes out and purchases a getaway vehicle. Uh, and the third person hasn't done anything yet but except meet with us and talk about it. All three of us can be charged with conspiracy, even though none of us is, you know, it's legal to buy guns, it's legal to buy a van. But if the government can build a case that shows this was all proximally leading to the commission of a crime, they can bust you for conspiracy. I think the idea is you don't want to have to wait till someone murders somebody to take action. You know, like, you know it's going to happen, so you just go out there and stand by the, by the guy that's about to get murdered and wait for him to kill him, and then you arrest him. Like, well, that's no good. So instead, we'll arrest them for conspiracy to commit murder. Um... A defense against all this is what's called the factual impossibility defense. The idea behind that is it's hard for us to say someone was going to commit a crime um, if the thing, if the crime that they were going to try to do was impossible. So, like, if somebody's already dead, you can't really arrest me for conspiracy to murder them if they're already dead. You know. Yeah, maybe I was making some plans, maybe I have some sort of sick, twisted role-playing game going on in my mind, but I haven't committed a crime because I could have never acted upon those plans, right? Does that mean people will sometimes plan crimes and plan them in such a way that it sounds like they're doing something that's factually impossible? Sure. Uh, but that's, that's a defense, okay? And then this co concept of agency is an interesting one. This is how we can try corporations. Corporations are legally people, and yet corporations aren't a single person. So if somebody commits a crime on behalf of the corporation, just like if I were to say, hire you to go kill somebody for me, I'd still be guilty of murder, as would you, even though I never did anything but, but ask you to and give you some money. Okay, Maybe I didn't even give you any money. Maybe I just asked you to because you're my friend. Will you take care of this guy for me, right? But the law allows me to be charged because you are acting as an agent in my behalf. Does that make sense? So if I'm acting as an agent in behalf of the corporation, corporation can be charged with a crime. Now, corporations can't be imprisoned, right? But certainly there is such a thing as, called, as corporate imprisonment, which in essence means a revoking of their ability to do business for an amount of time, which could pretty much kill a, a corporation. So that's the idea of agency, that somebody committing a crime on behalf of another person, both parties could be charged for that. That's a little different than conspiracy where we plan it together, like we're partners. This is more like 
you're you're working on my behalf. What's tough about corporations is if somebody went out on behalf of a corporation and and stole something, there would be members of that corporation who would be totally innocent, who had knew nothing about that, and maybe other members who were involved in other ways. But if the corporation is either fined or imprisoned, meaning loses its charter to be a, a corporation for an amount of time, all the par parties involved with that corporation are harmed, right? And so that's but that's kind of a risk we take sometimes when we when we join an organization of other people that that individuals within it can hurt the rest of us. That's you know that happens in families and it happens everywhere in any type of organization. All right. So here's some ways that you can, these are defenses to saying I wasn't responsible for a crime. Uh, the first is what's called a mistake of law. This doesn't usually work in the courts. This notion of I didn't know it was against the law. It never really works to, to claim that except if you're able to say, go to a government official and say, I, I'm here to get a license for doing this. And the government says, official says, you don't need a license to do this, and then you go do it and you get arrested for doing it without a license, there's a case where you might be able to use that defense. If you could prove that someone in authority had told you that you you know, that you had made a legitimate effort to be in compliance with the law and by no fault of your own you weren't. Does that make sense? That's about the only time that defense works. Whereas mistake of fact works a lot more often. Anybody ever walked out of a store with something they hadn't paid for? You know, the dog food on the bottom of your cart or something, and you just walk out and you get to the car and you're like, did I pay for that or not? Well, if they followed you out to the parking lot and said, let me see your receipt, and then looked and the dog food wasn't on there, their chances of being able to prosecute you are really slim, especially if you paid for everything else. Because if you could demonstrate it's an honest mistake, and really at this point it would be your word against theirs, and it's reasonably an honest mistake, then really mostly the, the worst that's going to happen is someone's going to say, can you just pay for the dog food? Yeah, my bad, and you do it. So that's called a mistake of fact. Again, are there people who try to pretend like something's a mistake of fact? Of course. I mean, that's the first thing people do when they get busted shoplifting. Oh, I didn't realize that was in there. You didn't realize that rotisserie chicken was in your purse. Right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, if it's eaten. Ah, I don't know how that got there. I don't know, but I know people, I know, I, I have seen many a mom who will, like, open a package of food in the store and let their kid, like, eat it to keep the kid placated and then pay for it at the, at the check, at the at the register. And it could be really easy to forget something like that or, you know, I mean, that can happen. And, again, that's not usually an intent to, to commit a crime there. I don't think I believe that. I promise. Don't you always tell because people go and eat them and they never pay for Who would eat them? Never. I never eat anything until I've paid for it. <laughs> you don't do that? No, me neither. I would think the most highly pilfered items would be like the candy bars. No, right there. The things right there that you could just grab. You could tell the things that, are, that they consider the highest risk, the things they keep behind cabinets where you have to ask an employee, right? Uh, I always think it's interesting that birth control is like that, I guess because people are like nervous about asking for it, so like teenage kids will just steal it if they can or something. I don't know. But yeah, you could kind of get an idea of what, what stuff walks out. I never thought of donuts. Huh. Baker's dozen. Um, uh, entrapment. Entrapment is where authorities force or coerce someone into breaking the law. So you've heard of like sting operations where cops pose as like a person who's a, a drug buyer and they get someone to sell drugs to them and then they bust them, right? Or, or they'll pose as, uh, as prostitutes and then when somebody solicits a prostitute, you know, that, that's a sting operation. That's not entrapment. Providing them an opportunity to break the law and then letting them break the law is not entrapment. But there are times when those sort of sting operations go beyond that scope where now they're taking someone who probably wouldn't have committed a, cry, a crime and inducing them. Come on, you know you want to sell me those drugs. Um, there's actually, I'm trying to remember, I'll have to find a few guys, a really great uh, This American Life where they went into a high school and they, they took, they had a young female police officer 
pose as like a senior at the high school. She was like 22 or 23 years old. And, you know, she would, she started building relationships with some of these young men and being like, do you know where I can get weed? And, you know, not really. I don't really do that. Well, can you get me some? And then, you know, here's this pretty girl asking to get her some. So he goes and gets her weed and then he gets busted for, for trafficking and weed. And like, that's an entrapment scenario where you have a person who probably would not have been doing that, but with, 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 and it was like over two or three months of her pressuring where he finally did it. And then they arrest him. Most of us would say that's, that's not right. Right. Yeah. Uh-huh. Sure. Uh huh. Right. Mm hmm. Right. Probably not, because again, posing as, as as a prostitute and then soliciting prostitution, or if someone solicits you and you go with them, you didn't force their hand really in any way. And so, but there's a fine line, and and as soon as it's entrapment, it's a defense. You can say, look, I wouldn't have done that. Uh, the last is lack of capacity. This is why we don't usually bust like an eight-year-old for for stealing from the store. Instead, we kind of make them go back to the store and pay for it, like recognizing they don't fully understand yet um, the seriousness of it. Um, or, or it could be an adult with, say, a mental uh, a capacity issue. Um, you know, so it's not just age. It could be mental capacity just to understand if something's right or wrong. So those are defenses. Um, finally, we have the procedure. This is the procedure it goes through when you get arrested for a crime. Um, uh, it starts with an, if they don't arrest you in the act of the crime, then they have to go to a judge and say, we have a reason to arrest them, and the judge issues an, an arrest warrant. So they can't just do it for no reason. Then you have it once you're arrested, you get a preliminary hearing, uh, in essence, where you get to uh, they get to decide if there's a reason to hold you or if they allow you to make bail. Okay. After that, there's what's called a grand jury indictment. A grand jury is a group of citizens who are uh, serving on a grand jury. They don't decide if you're guilty or not. They just look at the evidence the police provide and say, is there enough information here to charge this person with a crime? So it's a fairly low standard. It's not like reasonable doubt type of standard. It's just, is there enough to, to, to charge them? Uh, after the indictment, uh, then you start to, it goes to the prosecutor and the prosecutor can plea bargain, meaning they could come to you and say, look, we've got information here that could get you for murder one, which could be a death penalty, but we're willing to plea bargain down to murder two. If you're willing to plead guilty to that, we'll drop these other charges or whatever. That's what plea bargaining is to get you to, it saves a lot of money in the system to not have to go through a whole court case if you'll plead guilty. So if they've got a lot of times, you know, if they're, if they're willing to sort of, you know, just put you away for 10 years, that'll make them happy. Uh, after that is the arraignment. That's where you're brought before the judge um, and you answer to the, to the charge, guilty or not guilty or no contest, nolo contendere, it's called in Latin. Uh, no contest means I am not admitting guilt, but I'm willing to I'm willing to sort of take the punishment for the guilt and not go through a trial. The reason people will do that is because if you've done something that's also a civil offense against somebody, if you plead guilty, then in essence what they can do is in the, in the civil trial, say, look, he pled guilty. He already said that he did it. Whereas if you plead no contest, you can say, look, I'm not saying I was guilty. I'm saying looking at everything and the chance of me winning that case, even though I know I'm not guilty, it was better to just make the plea arrangement with them and, and take it. Um, so that's why that's, uh, that's there. Then you go through a trial, and then after the trial, you're sentenced. That's the process you go through. And then the last thing is the constitutional stuff. Um, the Constitution, we learned about these already, but it, the Fourth Amendment protects you against illegal searches and seizures. The Fifth Amendment protects you against double jeopardy, which means you can't be tried twice. If you're acquitted, the government cannot appeal. Okay? If you're convicted, and then you finish your, your sentence or whatever, they can't try you again for it. That's what that means. And that's in the Fifth Amendment. Self-incrimination, they can't force you to be a witness against yourself. You can just say, I'm not going to be a witness. That's your choice. 
The Sixth Amendment gives you a right to a speedy trial. In the federal government, that means within 75 days. Um, but there's all sorts of exceptions if processes are taking longer or whatever. Uh, the Sixth Amendment also gives you a right to cross-examine people, meaning if somebody is accusing you of something, you have a right to ask them your questions as well. Like you don't, it's not just the state gets to question them, and then you don't get to, to ask them questions either. The Sixth Amendment also gives you the right to assistance of counsel, meaning you have the right to a lawyer. The Eighth Amendment protects you from cruel and unusual punishment. And then the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments, the due process amendments, they, in addition to this whole process I just showed you a minute ago, the procedures, meaning they have to go through this fair process, it also includes a presumption of innocence that that they can't just assume you're guilty from the get-go. They've got to demonstrate or show that. Okay, so that's it. I know that was a lot of talking, um, but thank you for your attention, and uh, have a great day. What? You want me to go back?